this uh, story of Naomi and Ruth is, um, has been described as one of the most beautiful stories in the Bible. And uh, what differentiates it from many of the other books that surround it in, in the scripture is that this book is far less political, far less about um, the kings and the uh, social life, the, the um, commerce and all that. It, it's about the family. It's about relationships. Uh, it's a beautiful story about um, this uh, couple, uh, Elimelech and Naomi, who are from Bethlehem. And we know Bethlehem, it's the town that Jesus was born in. Um, and they play an important role because Jesus' lineage is traced all the way back to um, Ruth and Naomi and, and this story. Um, so that's an important thing to keep in the back of our minds. Now, uh, Elimelech, he said, he, Bethlehem is kind of a small uh, town. There's not a lot going on. Um, and you can kind of compare that to some, some of the smaller rural communities that are out here. It, there's just not a lot of excitement. It's, it's life is going on, it's normal. And Elimelech is looking for a little bit of opportunity. So um, he decides that he's going to move his family, um, Naomi and Kevin, to go to the land of Moab. Um, not Moab, Utah, <laughs> although that is a, a little bit more exciting. You've got some, some, some great little hopping scenes happening over there. Um, a, a modern theologian was, was describing uh, Moab as kind of like the Las Vegas of, uh, of, the, of, of Israel, that area at the time. Um, th th there was gambling, there was, um, there was a sense of danger, big city, um, hustling, um, but it was a land of opportunity. Someone could go there with nothing and, and, and strike it rich and, and do some really good with their lives. So this was what Elimelech had in mind. He, he moved his whole family um, from Bethlehem to Moab. Um, so imagine uprooting your family from, from here, wherever you are, and, and, and suddenly popping them in the middle of Las Vegas, a little disorienting. And, there's a lot going on. Well, shortly um, after they get there, um, Naomi has two sons, and they um, start, they grow up, and um, Elimelech doesn't quite make it um, rich. He doesn't quite succeed in the way that he had hoped for it. He dies. He passes away. And um, Naomi, makes, or, yeah, Naomi makes sure that her sons get married to some local girls uh, in Moab. And one of them is Ruth. Uh, now, later on, um, Ruth and her, uh, uh, the two sons of Naomi, pass away. So Ruth and uh, her other sister-in-law and Naomi are all left by themselves in this, in this land. Naomi is a stranger in a strange land. She's the foreigner in Moab. And she has these two um, native daughters who grew up in Moab. And Naomi has this realization that she can no longer remain where she's at. She has to go back home. Um, that, that too much grief has happened to her, and she doesn't have the support that she needs in order to survive. And she, she makes this huge decision to move back to Bethlehem, to her, her small little hometown. And um, she encourages her two daughters-in-law, who are now part of her family by marriage, <coughs> to go off and marry someone else and stay in the land. Um, now the other sister and daughter-in-law says, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go stay in this land and stay in Moab. But Ruth, Ruth has been touched by the gentleness and the character of Naomi and the sense of family, and she cannot bear to be separated uh, from Naomi. And she realizes, I suspect as well, how much uh, damage and how hard it will be for Naomi to go back to her homeland all by herself, a widow without any sons, without any any daughters or daughters in law. And so Ruth makes this brave, courageous proclamation. She says, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lay your head is where I will lay my head. Whatever your home may be, my home will be as well. And even may we do this until death part us. 
and we do so until death comes. In our uh, Christian liturgy, we have a similar phrase that pops up for us in our lives. And uh, it occurs when uh, a couple um, stand before uh, their family and friends in an act of marriage or commitment. And they, they promise to be with one another. And they promise to go with the other person um, no matter where that journey may take. For me, the story of Naomi and Ruth, it goes beyond just friendship. It, it talks about a profound sense of love. Um, and it, it would be difficult for me to uh, assert uh, from uh, my modern perspective that this would be a same-sex relationship, but I have my suspicions that that's probably what was happening here. That the two, these two women were with one another uh, in more than just uh, friendship, that they, they were lifelong partners in love and in work and in home life. And they take an amazing journey um, together. Uh, there's a love there that is, is profound and deep. Um, and, and as we get further in the book of Ruth, we see that the relationships change, but Ruth's commitment to helping Naomi and maintaining the family relationship is still strong. Ruth does get married to a man named Boaz, and that's where we get the lineage that, that goes on towards Jesus. Ruth's commitment to Naomi is one that is profound, and it is unlikely um, to have a foreign uh, daughter-in-law who is so committed to um, Naomi that she is willing to go back to a land that she has never known and to live and support her mother-in-law is, is beautiful. Where in our lives are those uncanny stories of relationships that are profound and beautiful that are beyond our expectations? The relationships that happen that um, we don't expect like the two-year-old toddler who makes friends with um, the 102-year-old uh, in the church. Um, where are those stories in your life? What is that story for you in your own life? Where have you experienced that profound sense of love? When I was uh, a young man in college, um, I, I have an identical twin brother uh, it's uncanny too because now my wife and I are about to have twins. Um, but my, my twin brother and I had that had that love, and I think a lot of times that love was expected. We were twins, and we grew up together, and so we were um, joined at the hip, not literally, but uh, uh, doing everything together. In fact, he himself is an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ uh, and serves a church in um, Ohio. Uh, serves a uh, faith community in Ohio at a uh, retirement uh, center. So picture this scene. Um, in college, my twin brother and I had gotten into some arguments, and we weren't BFFs anymore. We, we had gone through some hard stuff. And uh, we met at noon, at high noon, on this, this middle of the, the college campus, and there's all these college campus students wandering around in professory types. John and I kind of stepped into this little circle, uh, you know, with, with our cowboy hats and our uh, little thing of wheat sticking out of our mouths, and gunslingers at, at the ready to, to go into some sort of combat. And we walked up to one another and we, we had a two hour argument over what we thought was best for the other person. Uh, <laughs> Because obviously I knew what was best for my twin brother, and my twin brother knew exactly what I was supposed to be doing, and could obviously see that, and didn't understand why I couldn't see that as well. And we finally came to an agreement to disagree. And it was, it was this huge, devastating um, experience. It was a huge loss. I, I haven't experienced profound, dramatic, death in my life, but it really felt like that. Um, that I had lost my best friend over some agreement or disagreement that I, I, I can't even recall now. And the two of us turned our backs on each other. 
we walked away from each other, and I couldn't bear it anymore, and I, I left. I, I left the state, I left the college, and I moved far away to uh, a different land. And I finished my um, studies there, and I remember as I was getting close to graduating, um, my brother and I hadn't talked for years, which was just, just the way things had to be. And I remember I, I wanted to go back home to Colorado and see my family and just visit with some, some friends of mine before um, going back to uh, college and graduating. And my brother out of the blue called me up on the phone and said, hey Jeff, I'm gonna pick you up at the airport. When's your flight arriving? And I was like, well, this isn't gonna go well. <laughs> um, so I, I uh, had this little voice in the midst of all the broken feelings that I had about my brother that said, just do it. Um, we'll see what comes of it. And so uh, he picked me up at the airport, and we, we took a two-hour drive from the airport in the car in silence, um, not really talking to each other. We were, we were more or less strangers to one another. And um, we got back to his apartment, and um, he said, you can stay here for the night. And, and then we'll go see family um, tomorrow. And I was like, it's like, but before you go to bed tonight, I, I, I want to tell you that I've gone through some hard stuff over the last couple of years. Stuff that you don't know about, and, and, and stuff that's hard to explain. But I want you to know that through all of that, you were there with me in it. And you weren't physically here, but uh, you were sitting right beside me. The tough stuff came, the, the hurricanes in life, uh, the damaging uh, things that leave scars. And he said, I want to thank you for um, sticking with me when uh, I know that sometimes it's easy to walk away. <laughs> and here I am, I'm feeling really guilty, so I'm like, I didn't walk away. <laughs> I, left, I left town, I left you. Um, but my heart was still with him, and the proof of that was when he asked if he could pick me up from the airport, I said yes. The proof that we still loved each other deeply and profoundly was that I was able to say yes when every other part of me wanted to say no. And so he handed me that night um, a simple gift that reminds me of that holy love. And it's a, it's a very worn down Bible that I carry with me. It says on the dedication page presented to Jeff Dodson by his twin brother John, August 2003. And it's a date that I mark as something holy and sacred. A date that has called me back to the profound relationships that we have with one another. Our love transcended the pain of the world, the pain that we experienced as brothers. Um, it transcended the brokenness of our relationships. And it, it was a love that, when I left that conversation and, and the presentation of this Bible to me, just like I was really kind of spinning around. It was like, well, what just happened? Uh, I, I kind of make some sort of sense out of this. Sometimes it's, sometimes we want to make sense out of something that's really senseless. Um, maybe it'll take us years or decades to finally make sense of that senselessness. For me, it was the senselessness of a love that uh, was unconditional. Um, after that, I felt like I wanted to change my name. So in the, in the Bible, it says to Jeff. And, and I look at that name, and I'm like, that's the old me. That's it's not me. I, I go by the name Jeffrey now. And I know there's not much of a difference <laughs> between Jeff and Jeffrey. But the sense of Jeffrey is a, is a, is a name that means to me bringer and maker of peace. My name means something. In the story of Naomi and Ruth, Naomi returns home to Bethlehem. And everyone says, Naomi, welcome home, you're here. 
And Naomi says, I, I wish you would not call me Naomi because that person is no longer who I am. That I have come into a different name. And she says, I wish that you would call me by my other name. Call me Mara, which means the bitterness. For I've experienced pain that has shaped and formed me to the woman that I am today. You see, uh, we have experienced stories in the Bible where something so profound has happened that a change of name has had to occur. From Abram to Abraham, from Sarai to Sarah, from Naomi to Mara. Sometimes events happen in our lives that are so profound that, that it changes our name and who we are, and it changes the way that we want people to see us. When um, I was at a retreat this last weekend with um, Karen Caton and Martha Jones um, to talk about associations in the Rocky Mountain Conference of the United Church of Christ, we had gathered about 20 of us association leaders um, at Lafrey Camp, and um, we, were, we were sitting in the Grand Lodge having conversations about the work of our wider church body and how we support the church. And on um, on Friday, um, one of our pastors interrupted the group and said, I just wanted to pause and read something that just happened. The Supreme Court in the state of Texas um, just declared that um, even though they recognize um, the marriage between same-sex couples, um, the, the Supreme Court of Texas has decided that they do not have to provide the benefits that come with that marriage if you are not uh, of different genders in, in the relationship. So the Supreme Court of Texas took away the rights and privileges of being in a relationship um, from a whole group of people. And as this pastor shared that bit of information, the, the gasps in the room, the, the pain and the brokenness just kind of opened up. And something that was so beautiful to me was to see so many of your leadership, so many of your leaders here at the conference, break for a group of people that, that we can't name, we don't know, but we care so deeply and profoundly for them that we need to stand in solidarity with them and say that this is not the world that we dream of. We dream of a different world where, where love has the final word. And the next day, uh, Saturday morning, just yesterday, um, we were in the same group of clergy talking about the roles of the association, and we had to pause again with some other breaking news that in Colorado Springs, uh, on Friday night, uh, some individuals vandalized the Jewish temple and put swastikas and wrote racist words on, on the temple. And once again, our group of clergy and leaders sat in a circle of brokenness, wishing for and hoping for a better world. Like Naomi and Ruth, who experienced such great loss in their lives, sometimes it's easy to just like sit back and give up and be like, I just I can't take it anymore. There's just too much pain. Just like what I did with my brother when I said, I just I can't take this anymore that we're fighting. I have to get away from it. But rather, the Holy Spirit works in mysterious ways and calls us back into relationship in a love that is so profound. And as we were sitting there, um, several of the ministers from Colorado Springs and laity in Colorado Springs decided that we would band together and, and rally in support for that Jewish temple and for the people of Colorado Springs who were targeted by that hate and bigotry. And they created an event that will be happening today in Colorado Springs. I'm not expecting you all to go. Um, but to know, let you know that there are these events happening in our world at 3 o'clock. Um, congregations and people from all over Colorado Springs will be gathering at the Jewish temple to stand in solidarity with our Jewish brothers and sisters and to say that hate does not live here, 
Love lives here. The love is the name that we give this place. And it recalls in me that it is powerful to change the name. It is powerful when Abraham and Sarai changed their names to Abraham and Sarah. It was powerful when Naomi changed her name to Mara to say, hate is not the name of this town. Hate is not the name of this community. Love is the name of this community. Sometimes it's good to change our names. Sometimes it's good to recall where we come from and to return home. Regardless of whatever we do in our lives, regardless of the love that we experience, regardless of where our brokenness happens and where the healing happens, we know that a God of extravagant and confusing and unconditional love goes with us. God is that great companion that walks with us in the midst of those painful relationships. God and the Holy Spirit and the Christ are the ones who gather in a group of broken clergy sitting uh, around talking about the business of the church and compelled them to go forward and march in solidarity with our brothers and sisters who had been hurt so viciously by racism and bigotry. Love is our name. Christian is our name. God goes with us and transforms us all the days of our lives. And for that, I am eternally grateful. And I will never forget. Amen. Amen. Let us sing once again our song wherever.